Hello, everybody, and welcome to Energene's webinar series. My name is Gal Ramot from the Energene marketing team, and today we'll be holding our second webinar on cannabis genetics. We will save time for questions at the end of the webinar, and we encourage you to type in your questions during the presentation using the question tab, uh, or simply use the hand icon if you want to be granted the option to speak. This webinar is also recorded and will be posted on our website in case you want to give it another listen. Our speaker today is Dr. Uri Weishaus, Energene's cannabis and hemp genomics uh, expert with extensive experience in the industry. Uri has a PhD in plant and microbial, microbial genetics from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and has been with Energene since 2011. In the last several years, he focuses mainly on cannabis. We hope this webinar will be useful for cannabis and hemp breeders, molecular biologists, acad academic, <laughs> academics, and industry players who are looking to gain deeper understanding about genetics in cannabis and hemp. Uri, the stage is yours. Okay. Hello. Um, can't hear myself. Am I heard? C can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, good uh, day, morning, evening, wherever you are on the globe. Um, thank you for attending our webinar. This is our second webinar. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a um, few things relating to the future of uh, secondary metabolites or molecules in cannabis uh, and their um, connection to the market. Um, we're going to have, um, I'm going to show a background on secondary metabolites in cannabis, uh, explain a bit about the motivation for searching for new targets in this market, uh, our prediction of the future where we think this market is going, uh, and how to generate value for cannabis varieties, and I'm going to talk about our solutions uh, to address uh, all the directions that the market is taking with our quick genetics and canagene uh, products, which are solution for this uh, fast moving and changing market. <clears throat> I must apologize to people who are not expert chemists or expert um, geneticists. There's different backgrounds of people in this crowd, so we try to aim um, so it's not too technical. If it gets too technical or you have uh, specific questions, please email us or go to our website and contact our team. Uh, we'll happily address and elaborate and send links. Uh, on another note, uh, all of the presentations or references that I'm quoting here, uh, the links would be provided through our website. Check them out. You could read thoroughly um, all the information that I'm providing here. <clears throat> um, so a little bit about Energene. Um, um, we are um, not a cannabis company, so we're actually not uh, allowed to even touch cannabis. Uh, we take in DNA, we are a genomics company, we are located in Israel with a subsidiary in San Diego. Uh, we <coughs> work for others who do either breeding seed companies, major seed companies, or uh, companies de de developing final products and use plant material um, in the process, um, we have over 13 cannabis clients, mostly in the U.S. and Canada, also in Switzerland and Israel. We've so far sequenced over 28 cannabis varieties, uh, and we are all doing this as a hired gun, meaning we do not breed for ourselves or uh, use any of the um, information for ourselves. <clears throat> uh, so the overall view of our genom <clears throat> genomic solutions um, for the market takes into account that we look at a large breeding population, either your collection or uh, a population generated after exploring the diversity. We look at the sequence data either generated through us or through others, and we do the data analysis and we help you make the breeding decisions um, to improve existing cultivar performance or generate new cultivars uh, that produce target molecules and I'm going to talk a bit more about those target molecules. And then there's also other tools for gene discovery for the pharma industry or synthetic biology. I'll elaborate on that soon. Um, the main um, workflow that we use um, is either through Quick Genetics or Canagene database. I'm going to elaborate on these two soon as well. 
Um, so I get asked a lot, what's, why is the hype about cannabis? Sure, it makes you high, everybody knows that. Is it different than mint? Is it different than basil uh, or any other herbal medicine? And obviously anybody who's tuned in to listen knows that the answer is definitely yes. Uh, for the main reason that um, cannabis makes a specific family of uh, compounds called cannabinoids uh, that are highly tuned to fit mammalian systems. We have us uh, mammals and hu humans have a cannabinoid system or endocannabinoid system that mediates very important um, physiological processes in the body. Uh, we have different types of receptors on our cells. And these receptors are actually um, binding to the plant cannabinoids. And this is a, a trait unique to cannabis. Cannabis is one of the only plants that actually makes this family of compounds. Um, and, and they bind through very elaborate interactions and very elaborate effects. They bind the specific receptors. Uh, the major receptors are listed here. Uh, the most known ones are CB1 and CB2. But there are other types of receptors and some receptors that are even poorly studied. There are different distribution throughout different tissues and organs, and therefore the uh, implications and the effect of different cannabinoids on different receptors is a very complex, complex task to study. Every week it seems that we have new and more and more publications uh, listing the new uses for cannabis and cannabinoids. Uh, to treat human uh, disease and conditions. Uh, this is an example from two weeks ago. Cannabinoids were studied with antibacterial um, properties and they've been shown to act to cure mice of MRSA, methicillin resistant staph A, which is one of the most troubling issues in uh, hospital contaminations uh, in, in recent times. So it's been shown that it's as effective as vancomycin, which is probably the frontline antibiotic used in hospitals. Um, so that's that's a fairly new use. And also, and this is an example, you can see a lot of references and the actual um, references in our website, uh, a review about the role of cannabinoids in antimicrobial inflammation system and immune re responses. And the take home message from this slide and really this only lists THC and CBD, uh, is that this is a very complex um, effect and influence on, on human systems, uh, interacting with many receptors, and different receptors work in different organs, and therefore you have different responses in each tissue type. So the study of, of the interactions is A, complex, takes time, and um, quite expensive. But gradually, we're doing the science, mankind is doing the science, we're studying the interactions for cannabis, and as we move on, more and more literature is being published that shows the specific interactions in model system and whole, whole plant um, uh, systems given to uh, clinical trials. But I think the main reason why a lot of the people joined the webinar today um, is really asking yourself the financial questions. Most of the people who tune in are from commercial entities who want to make um, profits selling cannabinoids or selling plant material or extracts from this uh, wonderful plant. Um, since 2018, when the Farm Bill passed, more and more states in the US, and this is more or less the situation throughout the world with uh, legal permits changing from country to country, uh, this is the U.S. as an example. You ask yourself, where is all the hemp going? Uh, people are calling it full spectrum, broad spectrum, isolate, various kinds of products that take in uh, hemp flour and extract. It could be also cannabis where it's legal. Um, and as you can see, it's very simple, supply and demand, and these are prices of different types of isolate per kilo in Colorado. Over the last year, the prices have gone down from $7,000 to under 1000 and I think the prices are still going down, and this is for, um, well, isolate. I would, I would stop at that, mostly CBD products. And you ask yourself, 
if I'm going into this business now or going looking into the next three years, how am I am I generating value to the company? Uh, how am I generating value through um, growing cannabis? And obviously, these uh, uh, a lot of the players and so many licenses have been granted, and people are going into this that not everybody is going to remain in the business if they're just selling extract and CBD isolate. Um, and not only that, there's also an entirely new field of, uh, I would say, competition to some extent called synthetic biology or semi-synthetic biology. Uh, these are This is a partial list of uh, companies who've raised about a billion dollars over the last year and a half to do synthetic biology for producing cannabinoids outside of the plant. I think the most... Uh, uh, the leader of the, of the team is uh, Tewinot. They announced a few months ago that they're actually selling kilo quantities, commercial, of CBD and THC. Uh, they are. They claim they produce a lot of other cannabinoids as well, not yet commercial, but pretty soon they are. So this is competition, but it's a different product. This is a highly pure um, product that will be used in the pharma industry, something called API, Active Pharmaceutical Agreement ingredient and it's a different product than the one produced from plant as is um, one thing to remember about this uh, chart uh, that I wouldn't throw away the plant so far uh, so soon um, mainly because synthetic biology either in uh, other cre organisms uh, yeast bacteria cell free systems you 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 take the enzymes and the genes from the plant. You may manipulate them. You may uh, do actions on the genes and express proteins. But still, you need substrates. And right now, if olivetolic acid is your substrate, olivetolic acid costs uh, more than THC itself. So it doesn't make sense to actually throw away the plant. Um, so uh, talk about connecting to the plant still. Um, cannabis has, has made itself um, through, throughout evolution an expert in producing secondary metabolites. Secondary metabolites are metabolites or compounds that are not required for, uh, for the plant. It could do away without them. Uh, the trichomes, they exist in many other plants, but specifically in the flowers of cannabis. And these are the interesting parts if you're in this industry. Uh, this is a beautiful picture from John Page's paper uh, about two months ago uh, out of Vancouver. They looked at trichomes, and not only these are specialized organs to make specific compounds, they um, they have different profiles at different stages and different kinds of trichomes. So the time of harvest, the method of extraction, uh, the distribution of trichomes influences the complex nature of the metabolites that are extracted from cannabis. Um, and I cannot go into talking about um, cannabis without describing the full spectrum that this uh, plant makes. Um, on the right here, you see this rather old um, illustration of, of the full spectrum of plant metabolites made in, can in cannabis. And as you can see, the terpenes, for example, and the sesquiterpenes and the monoterpenes, are a very complex and rich group, um, but they constitute a very small fraction of the of the metabolites that are made in this plant. So it's cannabinoids and terpenes, but also flavonoids play an important role in the entire arsenal of uh, compounds uh, that make up cannabis and contribute to the entourage effect, meaning the sum of a uh, mixture of compounds work differently on um, creatures or cells than each individual compound on its own. And terpenes, for example, I'm not going into the terpene family at this talk because it's an even more complex than the cannabinoid uh, picture. There are a huge amount of um, terpene synthases in cannabis, making a huge diversity of molecules, but not all of them are unique to cannabis. And cannabinoids are a unique feature of, cannab of cannabis plant, and therefore we're focusing on them. So in order to first uh, to actually uh, do things with cannabinoids, you first have to have a, a detection method. And if you, you look at chromatography methods, you isolate and separate um, 
the different compounds in cannabis. The most prevalent ones, prevalent ones you see are anywhere from nine to 15 compounds where you could buy standards for them and you could have a, a system set up that lets you separate between close uh, resembling compounds, but also to isolate them as individual compounds and make sure you know and identify those. Uh, and it's not a trivial matter because if you're looking into uh, the common cannabinoids uh, that are in uh, single digits or double digit percentage in the plant sometimes and sometimes they're in very low concentrations some of them you can find some of them are very difficult to detect and you need expert know-how to actually discriminate them from other types of molecules so the first question I ask when people talk to me about cannabinoid um, enhancement or breeding is can you detect do you have a detection system to detect your molecule of interest um, so now, uh, and I do apologize for these molecules for those of you who are not uh, with chemistry background. I'm not going into details, do not be alarmed. I'll just say that there are over 150 known cannabinoids with names and uh, quite a few cannabinoids that have not received a formal name yet um, or not purely isolated, or not purely identified by structure. But they, um, the entire family, is uh, divided, you could divide on the basis of the uh, tail of the molecule, the skeleton of the molecule, or the carbon-oxygen bond, and they're divided into separate families, CBD, CBG, CBE, etc., but there are way more molecules in this huge family than the um, nine or 15 prevalent ones. And there's a new rock star, this is from a paper published uh, two months ago by Chidi in, in the group from Italy. Uh, they described CBDP and THCP, a new molecule with a seven carbon side chain. Uh, and it binds CB1, and they've shown that nicely in the paper, it binds CB1 um, stronger therefore creating a, a longer effect at lower concentrations. So there's a lot of interest in the industry and have been asked, can you breed for high THCP? So from my perspective, this is not a, a molecule that's more interesting than any of the other in the family of the less known cannabinoids. <clears throat> so if you look at the synthesis of cannabinoids, um, most of the cannabinoids or the simpler ones or the common ones start from CBG derived uh, from a pathway that uses olivetolic acid, CBG acid. Uh, and then there are three types of enzymatic actions um, to make THC, CBD, and CBC. But there are many other reactions that are not enzymatic. So you go into the major family types through enzymatic reactions. And there are many processes here that are enzymatic and we just don't, haven't found the genes and the enzymes that are responsible for them. You can assume that if a molecule is accumulated at a high rate, there may be an enzyme that makes it, but it may also be something in the plant that uh, exposes it to more oxygen and therefore more oxidation. But you could also divide uh, specific families and, uh, of cannabinoids, CBD type, CBDV type, and so on. And if you have a good detection system, system you could um, do activities with uh, the plant based on, on uh, ability to discriminate between the more exotic cannabinoids. Um, for example, and um, I, need, I want to explain here the difference between isolated compounds and uncharacterized mixture. So, if you have an analytic lab or, or you get services from an analytical lab, there's also a fraction collector that lets you analyze the sample, the plant extract, and separate different compounds. And whether you know what the compound is or you don't, they come out at different times. And if you have the right system set up, you could isolate and collect different fractions with one compound, multiple compounds, or all of the compounds in the plant extract. You could isolate them, you can mix and match, and you can test individual compounds uh, in different pathways. And then you can start doing bioassay on specific molecules and start to understand the effect of specific compounds uh, alone or in combinations on 
cell systems, different type of cells, cancer cells, different disease models. You could you could measure growth inhibition, cell death, uh, all sorts of parameters on cells, and you could move on to um, animal models later and actually move on to clinical trials later. But all of this requires a lot of expertise um, and it's not for everyone. Not everybody who has a cannabis growing and breeding company actually is able to do all of this. Um, so we think, and us being in Israel, we think that the trend uh, is towards not necessarily doing isolations and clinical trials. And uh, I would like to recommend this review that was um, released last, uh, it's a special issue that was released last uh, uh, week, and I'll, we'll have the actual reference at our website uh, by a lot of the big names in cannabis and cancer research and, and medical aspects of cannabis. Israel leads the trend in over 70 clinical trials, um, and they are uh, gradually being published per variety. And I'll show an example of that pretty soon. Uh, one of the leaders um, of, of this type of research, uh, David Meiri or Dedi Meiri from Haifa in Israel, he, just, he does the exact process I described in the previous slides where he isolates specific compounds. And here's a huge list of all the cannabinoids they can detect. And you can have each column of, canna of uh, cannabis. Each one is a strain of cannabis and its exact composition. And now once you have this, you could test different components of the isolate on model system. In the left case here, it's anti-tumor activity on specific types of cancer, specific cell lines. In the right panel, it's an animal model that's even more um, another step forward uh, that simulates seizures in mice. Uh, as a simulation for epileptic seizures. And you can actually ask questions on combinations and isolate the specific compounds. But obviously this is very high expertise. So unless you have access to this kind of technology, um, this is not something everyone can do. And it also, once you've found um, a specific compound, it leads to pharma, meaning you pretty much leave the plant and the pharma industry takes over an, is an isolated compound and tries to make it uh, outside of the plant. Um, so I think the real value, and the, this is a very complex slide with a picture from the actual website from clinicaltrials.gov uh, of a variety called Avidekel. And I think this is how you now create real value to your varieties. This is a clinical study that uh, uh, by Tikkun Olam, a company in Israel and also in the U.S., they gave dementia patients, um, this is a phase two clinical trial, they gave dementia patients an undefined mixture, cannabis oil, with this amount THC, CBD, but also a lot of other compounds that nobody really knows what they are. They gave that to alleviate the symptoms associated with dementia, not the dementia itself, uh, the results of that have been released two weeks ago with flying colors, not only is it well tolerated, it also was a very clear cut uh, effect uh, to stop most of the symptoms associated with dementia. So there you have an example of patients in Israel already asking, this has been public, uh, publicly um, announced, so you have already patients going to pharmacies and dispensaries and saying, no, I don't want cannabis with this ratio of THC and CBD. I would like to pay extra for Avidekel because I know this variety works. So there's new value generated through clinical trials. Um, I think it's stuck. Okay, not. Okay. Um, so to sum up the entire process of the two paths you can take with a new variety, um, imagine that you now have a variety that has any beneficial health effects reported to it. So the right path uh, depicted here with the green cross um, is the preclinical or medicinal non-clinical data collection or the well-being. If you have enough people who took a variety and they said, oh, this alleviates my, my sleep, this is, this is data. Um, so this creates bottom-up market demand for the specific cultivar. Uh, it must be associated with a cultivar, but it also means uh, production 
stays in the plants. Um, the other path is a clinical study um, that could have two outcomes. One is an isolated compound or compounds that goes to pharma and MPI, API, and the owners of this variety need to do gene discovery and, and do some IP generation. Um, the other option where the mixture is a complex mix of materials or the molecule isolated is complex or large or above three active compounds, it still means that plants have an advantage and production stays in the plant. In either case, you need to increase cultivar productivity. For exactly these cases, we have the quick genetics and canagene solutions. <clears throat> So what is Quick Genetics? Quick Genetics is actually a complete starter package that we offer for cannabis and hemp breeding that includes pretty much the whole shebang. Uh, we're setting up a consultancy, we're looking at your diversity and analyzing the genetic makeup of your germplasm and collection. Uh, we're assembling reference genomes from your germplasm and we're doing QTL and marker discovery for specific traits, and that trait could be a specific metabolite or other agricultural performance traits, and we're helping you design and create a breeding program that makes uh, better versions of these varieties. And the nice thing about it and the context here is we can actually apply to win this entire package. Uh, we're giving one package like this um, to uh, somebody who will uh, show us a very convincing idea of uh, what you want to breed for. You can still apply for that. It closes and gets announced. The winner will be announced in March 13, 2020. So you can still apply for that. Um, and then we have Canagene. Canagene is more focused on gene discovery or drill down of your into your own uh, germplasm. Canagene is actually a database that we set up uh, made of um, public data and updated regularly on with pub public data, also with proprietary data that we've generated on cannabis variety that we, we um, sequenced um, ourselves. Um, you could overlay and integrate this database with your own proprietary data and it allows you to drill down to the gene level, discover gene, um, interrogate interesting QTLs and find candidate genes in the QTL, generate marker for them, and also create IP and sell the IP or the genes discovered to pharma or um, synthetic biology industry. All of that with a um, data mining service provided by us in the database. And here's an example of what it looks like with real data. This is an F1 segregating population. It segregates for a rare metabolite. This is actually, uh, we're doing this uh, at Denny Mayer's lab in Haifa. We're isolating to find out what this metabolite is. We don't know yet. We think it's a flavo uh, or canoflavonoid or a combination of a flavonoid and a cannabinoid. It flows through the system, but it's a segregating trait that we're mapping out in an F1 population. Uh, in the process that looks like this. Um, you cross two parents with or without the unique characteristic. Uh, you create a segregating population. We analyze about 200 individuals. We find the locus that's responsible and associated with the interesting phenotype, in this case, the blood red, um, blood red compound. Uh, so we find the reason, the region uh, associated with that and within that region we isolate the individuals that have the specific phenotype and we find markers for those and we can actually zoom in to the gene and try to find what in the plant makes this specific compound and what um, uh, what the gene is if there is an, indeed a gene that makes uh, this compound. Um, so just to sum up the entire process we're taking phenotype data trait scoring from the client uh, genotype information and the parent DNA from the client cross. We analyze 200 individuals from the cross, either an F1 or an F2 populations. We associate specific regions in the genome with the trait and create a genetic map and genetic um, uh, markers for the specific trait. 
the next step is to actually use those marker and marker assisted selection and breed for an elevated level, a unique feature, integrate, stack traits, all of these things are done with the genetic markers uh, created in this um, process. And it allows the client to actually breed for new parents and generate semi-inbred parents with uh, homozygous um, alleles for the specific trait, or create a semi-inbred uh, clone or stack multiple traits together. So to sum up the entire uh, process, we think the future of cannabis is drifting away from simply being CBD and THC production. That's going to stay, but going to remain less profitable. Um, we can identify biosynthesis pathway genes for rare metabolites uh, for the pharma industry, active pharmaceutical ingredients. We could do large-scale data collection um, and preclinical studies. Uh, we, we don't do that, but we can um, use specific cultivars with the clinical or preclinical studies data and improve their productivity through breeding. Um, and Energene is here to assist you with all the breeding planning and um, processing and analytics required for this. And then this is another reminder to um, access our website and apply for a quick genetics package. Uh, the application is still due to um, open till March 13th. With that, uh, I'll end here, get a sip of water, and uh, feel free to ask us some questions through the um, What's that, the raise hand tab? Okay. All right. Okay, I have a question here. Second. Okay, I got a question here from uh, Monica Morales. She's asking, I grow cannabis and wish to start breeding. I can chemotype my lines and perform crosses, but I do not have a master plan. Can NRG assist me with that? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the questions. <laughs> the answer is a definite yes. This is exactly what quick genetics is. We help you plan. There's consultation hours in this plan. We analyze your germplasm and we help you design a breeding plan. And we figure out what exactly it is that you want to breed for. And we'll help you, um, if, if it's a segregating trait, we can map it and we can help you generate markers and, and uh, breed for uh, improved varieties. Next one. All right, next one is David Kovalik. He's asking, what is the best way to get uh, pathway genes information on new strains. How much uh, and how long for a hand preference genome sequence? Okay, so these are two questions that um, um, the timelines for for this would be different depending on what you want to do. A reference genome we do in up to four months to scaffold level, and if you want full genome assembly. We uh, do that together with uh, um, trait mapping, which answers your second question. Um, so that requires the three months for the genome assembly and then whatever it takes you to provide a segregating population. So if it's one cycle of say four months for generating the population and phenotyping, I would say around nine months for the entire process of mapping that, uh, that uh, particular trait of interests. Thank you, Ori. I got another one from Mark Gilton. Can you give more details of on how to apply to, for the demo project? Uh, I think you mean the quick genetics. It's it's uh, it's a contest. Um, so you go to a website. There's a link to it, and you apply and you answer a few questions. It helps us understand what clients really want and it helps us decide. It's not a lottery. We select the winner based on um, the most feasible and most um, um, interesting type of project. We've had various ideas so far. People have, have signed up for this with really good ideas, um, and it will be published in terms of, of the outcome. Um, so uh, uh, do apply. 
Great. I got another one from Mr. Zhang. What software do you use to map the QDL? Oh, so we use our own proprietary tools to process all the data. Um, it's it's not an open source code. It's our own proprietary tools. Um, that's uh, we've found our tools to be more useful uh, in analyzing large scale data sets that we use. Uh, they they work better than most uh, publicly available tools. Okay, uh, Kenny Lord is asking, we're hearing that THCP is potentially able to provide twice or three times the strength of THC or TH THCA. Is that legitimate? Um, so that paper has been released. There's a quote in the, in the website you could look. We'll have the quoted paper from Chidi in the, in the group in Italy. Uh, they've done really good science and tested the uh, biochemical um, constants and performance and binding assays uh, of a synthetic and a natural version of this compound. And yes, it binds CB1 receptor with greater affinity. So you could assume the effect would be longer, stronger um, in um, human cells. Mr. Bing Wang is asking, in general, how many high quality reference genomes are needed for my breeding material? Um, so, one high quality reference, if, if you have, um, it, depending, it depends on how large the breeding project is, assuming it's multiple populations relying on one key parental line, we will only do the one key parental line as fully reference assembly. The others we do at lower level, that's sufficient for us to map uh, markers and, and uh, map segregating traits. Uh, we can do comparisons of multiple genomes as well. Uh, depends on, on what uh, your um, needs are. Feel free to reach out and, and send us specific details. We'll happily answer questions. Thank you, Uri. Uh, we'll take a last one. Um, Joseph Kerner is asking, do you work with the Novos in Novo marker development in cannabis? I, uh, where's that? Do you... I'm not sure I understand the question. It's for gene mutation, he says. Do we work with the Novo assemblies? Uh, if I understand, uh, oh, so if it's a specific type of software, I'm not familiar with it, Novos, uh, we're not doing um, any other non-energy software, we're not using that, we're using our own proprietary tools to discover the markers and uh, um, our own tools to build a, the Novo assemblies and mapping populations and so on. Okay, Uri, thank you very much. Um, there are more questions, but we will not have time to answer all of them live. We will, however, uh, answer each and every question and send the, the answers back to you by email after this webinar. Uh, this webinar is also recorded, I remind you, and will be available on our website uh, within the next few days. Uh, so with that, I thank you, Uri, for the time. I thank all of the listeners for tuning in and uh, wishing you a pleasant day ahead. Thank you very much and goodbye.